Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another edition of the Liberia History Channel on Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jai, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. In tonight's edition of the History Channel, we're going to be honoring the legacy of Dr. Joseph C. Guano, a brilliant diplomat, historian, professor, family man, who departed this world on August 29, 2020. Two, Dr. Guano is a librarian hero, and we are glad to be honoring his legacy tonight. Joining me to do this is the presenter of the History Channel, Carl Famule. Carl, welcome to Focus on Librarian. Welcome to the show. It's always my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Dennis. And uh, Carl, it's an honor that uh, we discuss the legacy and pay a special tribute to Dr. Guano, the librarian historian whose textbooks has a student going, growing up in Liberia that I studied. And we're going to be going through some of his work, his yeah. biography, and some of the things that he stood for. Really, it's an honor that we can be part of this day. I really try, and uh, this is if I will have one regret for what I'm doing here. I tried to interview him and that was not possible. And that's oh. what I regret. Again, we are happy to be here and welcome. Thank you so much. So um, I appreciate, I'm honored actually to be able to discuss the work um, of, of Dr. Guanu. Uh, he's one of really just a handful of authors that I have to reference whenever studying um, Liberian history who are Liberian and present information from a Liberian perspective. In fact, of all of the people who have written on Liberian history, he has the greatest volume of work contributing to Liberian history from the perspective of African people. He would, I would place his work um, up there uh, with, with, doc, with Dr. Edward Wilmot Blyden, who also had, you know, lived of course um, and, and died a hundred years earlier, but he was just that um, prolific and detailed in, in presenting new information and new perspective, new insight on our history. That's uh, Dr. Joseph C. Guano. Yes. So today we say we are honoring the legacy. He was born September 17, 1940, and he passed on August 29, 2022. Uh, among some of the things that he did in the work, he was a laborious ambassador to the United States. He was also Minister of State for Presidential Affairs, I believe, under President Doe and also under President Amos Claudia Sawyer. And uh, he also, uh, he wrote some history books, textbooks. Not, uh, not sure if he was... He was really, he... really remember. Was he, was he was he before 1847? Okay. history up to eight no Labrin history before 1857, Labrin history up to 1847, mm -hmm. and beginning others that he's written. And uh, for us growing up, I use his books in in, in school. And so yeah. really uh it was one of those that I never met. I wish I, I did. And these are some of the things that has our city I think about. But uh, Dr. Guano was a, a great man. Anyone talking about librarian history, that's the first name that will come to your mind. Absolutely. I didn't realize he served under, though. I thought his, his appointment under Dr. Sawyer was the first as Minister of State. I, 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 I could... No, I stand corrected, but I believe when, uh, when the coup took place, uh, I believe he was recalled and uh, went back to Liberia to serve. Uh, Interesting. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Okay, Moses Namwe, while he was at the university in America teaching at Glasgow, before he could go back to Liberia to serve, he arranged for some scholarships. And he, Professor K. Moses uh, Nambe, was one of those who benefited from those scholarships and came to the United States to study. So, besides his history book and uh, in the diplomatic field, he also, you know, was the one who kind of uh, helped with the education of some Liberians. I That's wonderful. Also, professor of history, uh, Dr. Samuel Govo. At the, he said he was Dr. at the Cotton University 
university college, it was Dr. Guano who advised him to even take out history and say, hey, there are not many historians. Go into history and today, he went into history and he's a uh, adjunct at uh, Morgan State University, professor of history. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. I was not aware of that. So that's that's great information. And I'm sure there's there's many people that are gonna call in during the show and give their, their hopefully, if you can call in uh, and give their own uh, personal accounts of how Dr. Guanu impacted their lives and their academic careers. Right. And look, we want people to call in. If you are here watching, we'll put the number on the screen later on so that you can call in and say a thing or two about Dr. Joseph C. Guanu. Pay your tribute. Uh, one thing, maybe it's because the way we, we grew up in history was taught, but most of the time we don't have many librarians that have been talked about, that we all look up to, that are well, librarian heroes that we all talk about. I, I, I think or someone like Dr. Guano, you know, is pretty up there, at least, even though with uh, people not talking so much about librarians, and mm -hmm. being part of librarian, he's one of those that is being, you know, talked about a little bit. Yes. Some people look up to and say, yes, he was a, a great man and a great librarian. It's also, um, he, uh, he passed away in Uganda. He's also, his origin is Nimba County. And uh, Cole, you know, you, you come from Nimba as well. And yeah. so you also said both of you share the same county. <laughs> what history and Nimba people that you guys love history? <laughs> well, um, I don't know if, 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 that, if that's necessarily the case that Nimbians love history. Um, I, uh, am honored to be somebody who um, has benefited from the work of Dr. Guanu and helped to enrich my understanding of Liberian history. Uh, Dr. Guanu was, you know, probably the first Liberian history to, historian to really teach the people's history of the Republic of Liberia from a holistic perspective. Uh, so that that in, in fact is is quite an honor to um, for Nimba County to have produced someone who was able to. Uh, present a holistic history of Liberia, and not only from a political and administrative perspective, but also from a cultural perspective, which is incredibly important because uh, most historians that wrote about Liberia were not Liberian. They were yeah. European or American, or and when I say American, I mean of European descent. And those people uh, tended to write uh, about our history um, in, a, in, in often a very uh, demeaning and belittling way when it comes to the human beings that they were writing about. And of the um, emigrants, the African repatriates to Liberia, they also did a great job of, uh, especially Dr. Um, Edward Wilmot Blyden and others, did a very good and thorough job of documenting what they experienced and what they saw. What Dr. Guanu did was he brought in the oral history that which had not been previously written from the time period. So the, the perspective is um, deeper um, from that, the, the, that context. And so it gives another layer, another dimension to the story that would not have existed had he not put in that work to conduct interviews of elders who were um, you know, in the sunset of their lives before they passed. There's only so much you can collect uh, after someone's gone. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Guanu went into these uh, towns and villages and spoke to the elders, uh, uh, meticulously documented uh, what they knew before they passed. So um, that cannot be recreated. And for that effort that he put forth, Liberia should be very thankful. Right, and uh, you went into you know what I was about to ask, like, you know, we have librarians writing librarian history what makes Dr. Guano different? And what, what was his team? What was the perspective so, that he took? So Dr. Guanu wanted to, to be or to create what he had missed growing up, which was a story that told, I mean, a history that told his story, right? A history that told his story. And so he felt, you know, that he was pretty much not a part of the, the story that was being presented. So he wanted to be that person that, in, that, uh, that presented his story, 
in the greater context of Liberian history. And not only his his story as a, as a son of the of the North Central Territory of Liberia, which is Nimba Lokobong, but also uh, really deep, you know, uh, presentations on the Southeast, um, on, 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 on other areas of the country. He was, in fact, the first holistic uh, historian who presented the history of all Liberians. So when I say he wrote the people's <clears throat> history of Liberia, that's what I mean. The history that he wrote excluded no one. Yeah. And, and also, uh, and you already you mentioned already that uh, he went and interviewing people. So, like, did, did he? What was that actually unique to Dr. Kwanu? You know, some you know we always talk about the primary sources, secondary sources. People look at uh, records from libraries and uh, reading through Dr. Kwanu's history. Where did he get his information from? From conducting interviews. I mean, there were other projects even before Dr. Guanu that that chronicled oral history as well. Um, you've got the you know the Gola the Gola the Gola, excuse me the Gola folklore. You have many many uh, examples of people doing this, but it was always really just uh, hyper focused on on one area. So if you do the Gola folklore, it was only on this particular ethnic group. And then you had Beslow and others who wrote their own biographies, you know, people that were alive in the 19th century, you know, the 1800s, who wrote their own story. So Beslow has a biography that talks about growing up by uh, in the 1800s and, and what he remembers about his culture. But it is not encompassing of the entire country's history. It wasn't even in the context of the country's history. It was just, he was just talking about his own life. So we can draw upon Bessel's story to understand what was going on within the Vi Kingdom as Liberia was being created. But what Guanu is doing and what, I'm sorry, what Guanu had done and what his work has done is it has presented it in the chronological context of Liberian history as well. Right. And, you know, what was happening uh, you know, for example, if not for Dr. Guanu, none of us would have Suakoko's name on our lips. Yeah, that's there. And some of the work that Dr. Guanu did include Liberian history up to 1847. Yes. Liberian history before 1857. An introduction to Liberian government, the First Republic and the People's Redemption Council, 83 to 85. I think you got all the inaugural addresses of the presidents of Labro from Joseph Jenkins Roberts to William R. Turbert. Labro Civics 2004 to 2010. The perennial problems of Labro history 1989. I mean, I'm just amazed. Uh, yeah, I mean, issues and challenges of the regional integration in West Africa. I mean, this so man. I mean, you're talking about cultural anthropology, you're talking about political science, you're talking about political history. It, I mean, his, his volume of work is very comprehensive and then went on to write textbooks at a level that young people could understand, which was, you know, beautiful. And I think, you know, other than, than Doris Banks Henry's, I'm not aware of any other black textbook authors in the context of Liberian history. Yeah. No, that's that's very that's very important. It was uh, Dr. Joseph C. Guano, and uh, during his life, you know, he said some things. He also, I think, at one point, he he, uh, I think, he ran for office on a vice president, one of these. Uh, so he was also a politician. Yes. He says some things history-wise, and then we uh, we're going to talk history that we want to uh, play some videos, and then I want you to talk about those. Those videos. Uh, okay. As we remember his legacy, we want to see what he said when he was alive and some of the things that he thought about. That would give us an idea. What was the thinking about this man? What was informing what the work that he was doing? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Focus on Labro. We own the Labro History Channel. And uh, today we are honoring the legacy of Dr. Joseph C. Kwan, Labro historian, who passed away August 29, 2002. In Compass City, Nimba County. Let me play this first video call and let's talk about it. Thank you. You see, for those of us who are classroom teachers, we point to the classroom. See, see, perhaps if you went to the classroom and study your history, you will know where to go from there. Our history 
up to a court, up to before the war, they didn't teach us nationalism. No. The history was parochial in a sense that it centered essentially on the history of our brothers who came from over there. No sense of nationalism. The history was not comprehensive. It didn't include all of us. See, it was distorted. It was distorted. For example, the role of Madame Swakoko in Liberian history was never in our history book until I, I had it in the 10, 15 years ago. It was never in Liberian history. Characters that only assisted the settlers are those that you found in, Liberian, in our Liberian history. See, Liberian history did not say the 16 tribes are Liberians and we have a common identity or we have common denominators. It didn't emphasize that. See, everything was settler-oriented, settler-oriented. So as a result, we developed more ethnic nationalism or ethnicity than Liberian nationalism. Today, 2013, you ask anyone, who are you? Especially in, in the remote villages, I am Basa. You say, I am a Liberian. No, I'm a Loma. I'm this. Our history did not teach us that in the past. So this is a new beginning that some of us will want to foster. Wow. He said there was no nationalism because he didn't teach us about being Liberian. So we went to our ethnic cleavages. That is yes. profound. It is. And so what Dr. Guanu is talking about here is not the work of William Hurd or Blyden or any of these prolific Liberian authors. What Guanu is talking about here is curriculum, academic curriculum developed for shaping the minds of young Liberian students. This curriculum was extremely uh, narrowly focused on only those who came from the United States. And even in that context, really, really, I, for lack of a better term, whitewashed their story and made them into a homogenous group while simultaneously erasing the legacy of the indigenous people who even were educated early on and contributed to developing and advancing the cause of the state, as well as the exclusion of the importance of the people who were semi-autonomous still in the uh, what they consider the hinterlands at the time. So Dr. Guanu is describing in this um, a story, I mean, uh, uh, um, the negligence of the Liberian curriculum as it relates to history. There were many people completely erased. For example, the huge population of recaptured Africans, which are people who came from other parts of Africa who were unlawfully uh, uh, pulled into the transatlantic slave trade and redirected to Liberian soil. That population of people exceeds the population of, reca of, of repatriated African-Americans. Those people's story is completely omitted from the academic record of history that's presented to students. So if you're going to even learn about them, you have to go and dig outside of the Liberian uh, uh, school curriculum to find this information. That's a travesty because many Liberians, there are more Liberians who descend from even the recaptured Africans than there are who descend from African Americans. And so it gives people a false consciousness, a false identity. So a lot of recaptured African descendants uh, don't even know their own roots, their own history, their own story. They're omitted from the Liberian story. There are also great numbers of what we consider to be native uh, or indigenous people who did magnificent things. They are only discussed in the very peripheral kind of like a footnote. How much do people study, you know, the Didwo Twez and the Wolos and the, the Natesie Brunels? How much do Liberian young people in high school? I mean, once you get to high school, I'm just talking about, you know, you're not gonna get into these details with maybe an elementary stu school student, but when you get to sixth, seventh, eighth, you know, ninth grade, you're getting into some real 
depth of thinking. And at this point, the curriculum should be presented to young people in a way that is inclusive and comprehensive. We are not saying, and I don't think Dr. Guano was saying that there's anything wrong with talking about and, and, and uh, uh, teaching the history of those who created the Western style state, but the omission of others who contributed to not only advancing the cause of the state, but defending the sovereignty of the state. That was a tragedy and that made people feel that they were not a part. It not only made the, 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 the descendants of the indigenous people feel they were not a part, it also the same curriculum made the descendants of repatriated African-Americans think that they were the only people who developed the state. So everyone is being fed this very narrow, misinformed, misguided, uh, uh, watered down version of our history. And they're all behaving accordingly. So you'll hear the descendants of repatriated African-Americans say, this is our country, we created a country because they don't know the rest of the story. And you'll hear, you'll hear the sons and daughters of indigenous people who fought for this flag say, the flag does not represent me, this is not my country. You know, you still hear this in 2022 because they don't know any better because mm -hmm. of the way that the history was presented. So what Dr. Iguana was trying to communicate in this is that we have to tell an entire story to create a sense of national identity and belonging. If we fail to do so, if we fail to let everyone know what stake they have in the nation's development, its creation, its protection, its advancement, they're not going to understand why um, we're all, you know, living underneath this one banner that we call the yeah. flag of Liberia. So, uh, and I see the distinction you're making there when Dr. Guano said the history was written this way, or the history of Liberia did not include everybody, or the history, you're saying what he's saying there is merely the curriculum because the history is there. Yes. Because he's a teacher. Right. He's an educator. So his, his focus, obviously he knows better because the history is there. Right. What he's focused on is the curriculum. The way it's being history, presented to us. The history, the, his, the, his, the curriculum that's being presented uh, to students in the country. And, and, and I know we talked about this before. Was this intentional? What's responsible? What, what, why is because it that our, our curriculum unfortunately because of lack of resources and many other things that you know we, we we talked about in past shows the curriculum for liberian history contrary to what people think was created by by foreigners really missionaries missionaries foreign missionaries and later on at, enhanced by even peace corps people i mean what do peace corps people know about creating curriculums everything is going to be from, from their perspective so if you're allowing people to come into your country and and create your your, your curriculum, you, they're teaching your your children to see the world through their eyes. So it's not even really that Liberian history was focused on on repatriated African Americans as much as it was on America itself. Yeah. On America itself. So even the repatriated African Americans were not learning about their heroes. They were not learning about the great thinkers like Elijah Johnson and Hillary Teague. They weren't learning about them. No. They were learning superficial things about presidents, their names, you know, and when they served. Not the deep philosophical thoughts and the patriotism and their yeah. pan-Africanism and their belief in the oneness of African people. They didn't teach that. So even the, 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 the descendants of repatriated Africans are being taught that this is a Christian nation and Liberia was created by Christians. They don't explain why the cross was removed from the Commonwealth flag and replaced with a star. Because in 1847, some very wise people said, this is actually not a Christian nation. We have people of other faiths under this flag. They removed the cross and replaced it with a star because they wanted it to be religious freedom, which was extremely revolutionary in the year 1847 to, in forward thinking. Yeah. They don't know this. So you will still hear the descendants of repatriated Africans saying, but it's a Christian country. And I'm yeah. like, you know, then why why did they took the, the cross off the Commonwealth flag? 
because they don't know their own history. They don't know the brilliance of their forefathers because it wasn't put into the curriculum. You know, that, that is that is very important. You, you you stated that right. So what that also did, it made the uh, the uh, descendants of those repatriated Africans to look towards America as this uh, our Father in Heaven, hello be thy name, right? And that's, that's why some bene benevolent savior of, of, of yeah. Of, yeah. This is Monrovia. I mean, we owe this to James Monroe, even not realizing what their fathers have done for the country and you are yeah. you know appreciating James Moreau and other uh, you know. I mean the, the emphasis is, is the emphasis is on you know Bushrod the emphasis is on Eli Ayers and Stockton yeah. the emphasis is not on Hillary Teague the emphasis is not on uh, uh, EJ Roy or Benjamin JK Anderson or Arthur Barkley that's not who the emphasis is on Many Liberians don't even know about these people. And it's not only indigenous children, it's also the descendants of recaptured Africans and repatriated African Americans. Because everyone went to the same schools and got the same terribly yeah. American perspective curriculum on their history and culture. And that's, that, that is some of what led to the division because yeah. you let someone else tell your story, they're gonna tell it through their own eyes. And what they choose to see and what they think is important. They don't want you to know about your your patriotic revolutionary past. They want you to be subordinate. They want you to be obedient. So they'll teach you the things that they want you to know. Right. And, and they teach you that uh, because at the end of the day, what did we see? Natives this way, <laughs> repatriated Africans this they, way. Yeah, and they're going to come up with these with these legendary fables about. Uh, right. um, about a cannon in Matilda Newport and you know firing a cannon and killing a bunch of natives because right. these stories are analogous to what they were doing in the American West. Exactly. Native so this is what they were doing. They were killing natives in the American West. So this in America made the, 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 the white Americans, the European Americans feel that they were advancing the cause of Europe and, 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 and great expansion of the European. So they were killing the natives. So they brought this mindset when they created even the Matilda Newport legends. You yeah. know, it was it was that, you know, thing of, a, you know, then you start hearing words like pioneer that never existed in the tongues of the people that they're calling pioneers. They never called themselves pioneers. That's an imposition of thought and mindset from the Americans who created the curriculum. But the African-American repatriates themselves referred to themselves as Africans and or emigrants. They didn't think of themselves as pioneers and I've never read anything from that time period where they called themselves pioneers. That's a very European mentality that they did not have. They knew they were repatriating to the home of their forefathers. You wouldn't be a pioneer returning home. It makes no sense. Hmm. Talking about what Dr. Guano also said, so looking at that, he brought up another subject. Let's take a listen. Akogo was very influential. She had three qualities. She was very, very pretty. She was hospitable. And she was powerful. She was powerful because she inherited those powers from her grandmother, who was... Uh, we call them in Liberia Zoos. Zoos are uh, special people who have special powers, See, spiritual powers, as we say. So she, she inherited those powers from her grandmother. Then, of course, she was very pretty because of which she fell in love with the concrete general that came here, one of Captain Harper. His descendants are still in Swakogo, maybe one or two. Okay. And then she was very hospitable. No stranger would pass through this area without Madame Swakogo giving. Uh, that person water to drink. So because of that, she became influential in the community. But as we said earlier, she was among a host of men because every three or four villages was a state. And there was a very powerful state across the river there in Banga called uh, uh, Wolemia. Okay. Very powerful. And he vowed that Madame Swakogo should not be a leader among them here. And she wanted to remain a leader because of that she got in touch with the president in Monrovia, President Dana E. Howard, and Dana E. Howard responded and sent a captain here called Captain uh, Harper. Harper, by the way, was an American, was a, a black American. Okay. Came here and with few soldiers, she was able to retain her power. Okay. So this is how she became very popular. 
That's the story of Madame Swakoko because she, Dr. Guano from the um, the video before was saying, you know, some of the people were left out. Example is Swakoko. And now yes. he's giving a little more detail. So she was left out of the curriculum. So he inserted her back. He, he resurrected her memory and brought it to the importance and prominence that it, it deserved. That is incredible because otherwise, this is what I say when I talk about the people's history of Liberia. Um, he's, he's, he's giving people in the North and Central Territory an understanding of how they became incorporated into the, the greater state. And before that, before the story of Suakoko, the understanding was it was some kind of, you know, conquest like what happened in, in North America or Australia or Mexico, right? You think that mm -hmm. they come in with guns and they push their way in and take over the native indigenous people. And what Dr. Guanu has done is said, no, you, you had these powerful people. Here's a Queen Zul from a powerful matriarchal line and lineage where these powerful men and women ruled and gender was not an issue. It, well, their, their power was derived from something greater than their physical attributes, something more profound than gender, right? So you have Suwakoko commanding armies and commanding men and she was a descendant of great woman zoes or queens queen zoes as i call them so this thing of uh, you know people saying oh she was the first uh, woman uh, queen she was not the first woman queen she was the first woman to be paramount chief and that is a difference what is important for us to understand is that paramount chiefs are not african it's not an African cultural tradition to have what's mm -hmm. called a paramount chief. This is a British creation. And when the British uh, began, you know, the partitioning of Africa mm -hmm. and the Europeans, the paramount chief becomes a uh, proxy to the European or the Western power. So this is their agent who is now paramount to the lesser chiefs. And this happens after they have been annexed and incorporated uh, or subjugated. So Suakoko was a queen before she was given the title of paramount chief. And she came from a long line of women who ruled through their own right and their own tradition. The important reason that Dr. Buanu presented Suakoko and put her where she belonged is because in the very early part of the 20th century, from about 1900 to about 1920, as they tried to exert their influence over the hinterland, which was pretty much autonomous until this point, from 1847 until about 1900, they could not do it. They did not have the power or the resources to do it. The Northern Central Territory was held together by a very powerful federation of ethnic groups. And these people were not allowing the Liberian government to annex them. There were also many rolling wars between them. We've talked in the past of Samore Ture's Wosulu Empire collapsing in 1898. Mm. And what occurred afterwards was chaos. There was a push downward into the Liberian territory of these people who were defeated, uh, remnants of the Wosulu Empire, entering into the Liberian territory. And they came in with violence. And these people were of multiple ethnic groups. Uh, I call them Pele Madingo, Loma Madingo, because these are people who had been part of Wosulu and had adopted much of the culture of the Malinka people. However, their roots were from the Guinea forest region, which was usually Bandi, Pele, Loma, and all of these things. So ethnicity was fluid. As they moved in, Queen Suakoko and others were fighting, resisting the encroachment on their territory. So as Wosulu fell and the French took over that territory, the remnants now needed to expand their territory southward. There were these violent wars. Queen Suakoko was now left with a very difficult choice. I, I don't think that th this is what Dr. Guan and other historians say it was a difficult choice. I don't know what they mean by difficult. To me, the choice was obvious. You have 
these forces, this chaos brewing, lots of wars and death and, 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 and uh, 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 destruction, the burning, the slashing and burning of villages, um, you know, massacres. They could not control the situation. And at some point, it was Queen Suakoko who made the decision that it is better for us to seek the protection and the stability of being Liberian than to continue these wars and eventually end up French territory. This is the part that people never talk about because if the Liberian government had not come and exerted control, this chaos would have given France a cause to then annex the territory for themselves. And mm -hmm. all of those places that we call Nimba, Lofa, Bong today would have been Guinea, if not for this one woman and her very brilliant decision. Right, this and, and call that, that could also mean that, uh, because nobody liked to surrender, because I think they were looking at, uh, like the power in Monrovia has foreign right, so how can we just surrender our territory and our control over to them? So I think it's from that perspective that um, it was difficult. That uh, okay, it's better to give this because each of those areas controlled by them was a nation by itself. So now right. you are giving it up to a foreign they, power. So to that should be difficult. yeah. So 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 the thing I I I understand which is true. However, the sovereignty was not an option and they knew it wasn't an option because much of this chaos was being instigated mm. so that the, they could then, they would either lose their sovereignty to France or to Liberia. Okay. But, but you know, politicians, right? They don't, they never give up. Even when it's very clear that you're gonna lose, they say they're gonna win. I think she knew better because th those who did not know better are, are Guineans today. And I think we don't give her the credit that she deserves in having the foresight that she had. I think she understood what the choice was. Right. But she's a I think she knew that I think she knew. Zool, that, think she knew yeah. <laughs> well, not only that, but she had she had she had this massive military. They knew what was happening north of them. And they knew that the French were subjugating people and also destroying shrines, yeah. destroying traditions, destroying shrines and mosques, right? Because you had a lot of Muslims in the north, what is now Zerikuri, part of which was part of the, the southern portion of Wosulu Empire. So they knew what the French were doing. She had intelligence. So it wasn't like she was just, you know, in some little place. People would come back and say, oh, all of these massive traders, these trading networks, the, 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 the people in the north were producing, they were the ones purchasing goods from them and all kinds of things. It, they're letting them know, hey, they've burned all of these cities, these trading centers. They've burned the people's mosques. And there's you know, all of these refugees from Wosulu coming into the, the, the area, the region. They're coming with violence. So she knew things would never be as they were after the partitioning of Africa. Maybe she didn't understand that there was a Berlin conference and that they had carved out Africa, but she understood the world had changed and that they could no longer really govern themselves the way they had been doing prior to the situation. And in order to save herself and even save her enemies, she understood that they had to stand with Liberia. Hmm. And Cole, I think also we're talking, uh, like Dr. Guano said that uh, these people were erased. So for a lady, a woman like Swakoko, at a time that she was a leader, what was happening to women in the United States? Exactly. So there no incentives for them to promote women to say, well, what we have been not been able to accomplish is happening in this place in Africa. Of course. Well, they didn't want to give Liberian women the idea, especially indigenous women, the idea. You're bringing in Christianity from a perspective of the inferiority of women that they're the property of their husbands at that time, right? So you're bringing in these new traditions where the traditional setting of African women before the introduction of some of these Abrahamian religious practices was a balance, was an equal yoke, yeah. you know, equality, not sameness, right? So the, the, the woman's weight was just as heavy as the man's weight. That African reciprocity and balance that's true. That the ancient ones called ma'at, 
that was not in line with the perspective of the European and Asian mindset. When I say Asian, I mean Arab, of course. So they're now bringing in this force. And so they cannot show the greatness of some of these queens. So they wrote them out of history. And, and also, if you present the situation as an indigenous force, voluntarily, you know, they keep pushing this thing about a difficult choice, a difficult choice. It was a strategic choice. They saw the kinship, whether the cultural difference or not. They understood that the choice was between France and Liberia, and they chose Liberia. That message was erased from our history. Yeah. And so all Liberian people are growing up thinking that Nimba, Lofa, Bong, when I say Lofa, I'm including Boparu because at that time it was part of Lofa. That northern central territory, the annexation of that was through the consent, through the consent and the, the assistance of Queen Zou Suakoko. Yeah. And, and as the assistant from her friend, Daniel E. Howard. Yeah, well, that, you know, President Howard was the one, you know, trying to, that had failed and all of his predecessors to penetrate the area. And it was, it was Queen Zosuakobo that understood that this, that, this, that this could happen and she agreed. And the reason, the reason Gompa is called Ganta is because Queen Zosuakobo and her, her army, they spoke Pele. So every town was Ta. So you get to yeah. this place, you get to Gompa, oh, this is Ganta. You know, so you, you see where her influence is even going into Nimba, you mm -hmm. know, and so these are the reasons why I'm Liberian and I'm not in Guinea. It mm -hmm. wasn't because somebody came and hit us over the head and said, you're Liberian. It was because the Queen Zoe made a decision. And when she spoke, nobody spoke after her, not even the birds in the trees chirped. And so what she said is what happened. It was not even the power of, that, uh, of President Howard. It was her power that manifested the destiny of that entire group of Liberians, which is the majority of the population of the country. Yeah, yeah, that is the, the largest. So uh, Dr. Guanu talk about nationalism versus ethnic nationalism. And uh, being someone who experienced the war and uh, Dr. Guano put it better than the way I've been thinking about it. Because during the war, what happened was uh, when there was no central authority, when Liberians did not feel that the government was going to protect them. So each of us went to our ethnic group. And so you had Loma Defense Force, Gravel Defense Force, this defense force, because that's the only people that you felt, you know, that you could protect you. Because there was not their central authority. And we have not even learned to have that strong allegiance for the country like Brother Hey, we all want people. So Dr. Guanu is right. So that's how ethnic nationalism and even up to today. Exactly. That is still a problem. And we we sometimes give it a bad rap and say, Oh, this is tribalism and this is the people are bad, but something gotta hold you together. Right, and you you got to go somewhere to feel that sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Stories we were told growing up about you know war and how our ancestors were strong. Those came from our ethnic groups and the particular clan that we came from. It did not talk about how the overall country Liberia, how we were strong, we were powerful, we did this, we did that. So these were not things that we were told. So each tribe or each clan or each household was told about the greatness of their quarter. So I, I can really relate to what the, Dr. Bono is saying here. Yeah, so we didn't, we didn't, um, we didn't, we were, we were annexed in the North Central Territory. So the majority of the population of the country, especially those of us that are not on the coast, this story of Suwakoko is really about the Northern Central part of Liberia. It's not about Cape Mount. It's not about you know Riverside or Bassa. It's not about Maryland. It's about it's about the the, the Mendi speaking people in the northern central territory of the country. 
um, you know, Pella, Loma, Mano, all of these these, these uh, northern people. And the, the important, I think, takeaway for us is to understand that we were semi-autonomous until the, the, the 1900s. We, in fact, we were all autonomous. In fact, there was really no influence from anyone. And we were not, you know, the, the subjugation that occurred, occurred at our own hands. The wars that occurred occurred at our own hands, and so once we became uh, incorporated into Liberia, it was a very slow process. Going in there and putting a flag down, and all of the zoos. Remember, I said nobody spoke after her. Not even the the birds and the trees would chirp, and and so they agreed. They agreed, and they defended the flag. They defended the flag, and so, but at the same time. There were, there were two things that happened that's very important. Land sovereignty remains. So people's clan, uh, uh, tribal land, as they called it at the time, people's traditional land still remained in control of the clans. And also a lot of these powerful zoos in the Northern Central Territory didn't want to give up their power over their people either because they owned the forest. Yeah. So if they say, hey, I need 600 people to go work in my massive farm, nobody could say no. And you you didn't have to, you didn't get paid for it, you know. So they didn't want full annexation. They didn't want to give up their complete sovereignty. But what they agreed to was more of an alliance. And that is where the process was long and slow because you're talking about these very ancient uh, 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 connections and, and 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 organizations of people. And uh, em it, it's remnants of, 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 old, of old nations not wanting to erase themselves up until 1964. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it, you still, you, you hear Bishop Kula and others talk about how they didn't want the roads to come in. They said, if this is civilization, we don't want any part of it. Right. Because y'all changing our, our women, our children, not listening right. to us anymore. They're changing. So there's, that resistance continued until the 60s and 70s in this country. Yeah. And so this was, a, this was an alliance, but with no framework document. No, I'm kidding. The, it was deeper than a framework document. Oh, you're talking <laughs> about between the government and the, and the people? Yeah. Um, no, I'm yeah. kidding. It was, it was something, it was because they didn't really have, so even when you're talking about hut tax and stuff like that, when they started, okay, we're going to start taxing, what happened? The chiefs are like, yeah, okay, we'll tax. Okay, some for me, some for the government. So it was a, mm -hmm. a, you know, they didn't want to share their resources. People act as though they didn't pay taxes before the Liberian government came into place. In in in, in my culture, in our in our history. So this is the other thing. People talk about hut taxes. You, the sis, the, the way the system worked before the the Liberian government came in. The way the system worked was. If you went to go hunt in the forest and you got an antelope, instead of paying tax on the antelope, you carried a whole antelope to the chief. Papa, I found this animal in the forest. You don't even call it antelope. You just say, I found something in the forest, Papa. And the chief will come out of his, his house or from off his chair, he will look at it and he will say, okay, take this leg and give me the rest. And so instead of you paying tax on an antelope, the chief gives you the portion he wants you to have. Before this system of annexation occurred, everything belonged to that central authority. And out of the wisdom of the way the system was set up, everyone got to get something. So you would take the leg, but then not that the chief would take the whole thing and eat it, but he would then divide the rest and give it to those who need it. Yeah. So he, that, that, that distribution that taxation system already existed. But if our history had been holistic, our people would understand that is, there's nothing strange about it. What the problem was, is that it was different, it was foreign, and it was not being implemented in our tradition. Now, it was foreign because what we knew was communalism. Yes. So that, that animal belonged to everybody. Dr. Guano stress another important piece here, and it's about rewriting Liberian history. Let's take a listen. Liberian history needs to be rewritten. It needs to be rewritten because it does not 
it does not include uh, many of the makers of Liberian history. For example, Madame Swakoku is not has not been our history until very, very recently. It has not been, or she has not been in our history, I'm talking about written history, not oral history. Oral history, yes, she is there. But written history, or accomplishments, what impact did she make on government? What impact did she make on her own society? We need to know, about, we need to know more about this. When we talk about Madame Swako, we're talking about all the, the Madame Swakokos, from Cape Mount to Cape Palmas, from Vitaun to Vanjama. We need to have them included. And to do so, we need to make some sacrifices. Okay. Some of the sacrifices would be to go to the Western world where Madame Swakoko's memorabilia are there. We go to the Western world where records are there. Or what she did here, for example, the Howard team that came here in the 1920s. Okay. We need to visit them. Okay. So what we are doing on the, the footage, uh, Madame Swakoko's footage, if historians read it, they will be able to interpret more on our, on our accomplishments. Of course, for impact on the society, and how, it's going to in, how they inspire us to do more about ourselves, to know more about ourselves. And just, uh, just maybe from my end, maybe Greg still has some more questions, but from my end. <laughs> my old friend, Emmanuel Yuri, they're interviewing. Yeah. Emmanuel Yuri did good with that. Yeah. yeah. He's uh, re-emphasizing the point about the missing pieces and what needs to happen. Yes. And so, you know, I think that the, this generation of scholars, um, we need to be the torch bearers of that vision of Dr. Guanus. And we do need to rewrite the curriculum. And again, when he's talking about like when history needs to be written, rewritten, he's talking about we need to rewrite the curriculum to include all of the evidence and all of the information in a historic manner and not exclude information that's available. You shouldn't have to go to, you know, the United States, uh, Indiana mm -hmm. University to think, find out, you know, that there was a person called King Momoru or you have to go to the Library of Congress, you know, to find out the names of, 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 of the great ones who came even before, before Liberia was established or go to the British archives or all of these things. These things are the responsibility of a country to create its identity. You must know its identity. You must know who we are. And so I think uh, my, my um, I encourage all of the young scholars of Liberia uh, who are studying especially social science sciences, if you're studying history or political science, even economics, you need to do so from the perspective of your Liberian mind and your Liberian eyes and your Liberian understanding. Uh, that's how you advance the cause of your nation, not by memorizing and regurgitating what people think in the West. Bring something new to the table, which is your truth and your reality and your story. Um, I, unfortunately, what I'm seeing with many of the scholars, they're not following in Dr. Guanan's footsteps. What I see them doing is quoting, you know, they're quoting European scholars about themselves. They, they don't even cite Dr. Guano. They don't even cite Dr. Dunn. They don't cite Edward Wilmot Blyden. They don't cite William Hurd. They don't cite, you know, uh, uh, um, Hilary Teague. Um, he wasn't French, so he wouldn't have pronounced his name Teague. He would have said Teague. So if you meet African Americans in the South in the United States whose names are spelled that way, they say Teague with a strong G, but they don't cite these people. They cite, they cite instead, you know, European authors, because what they're doing is reading their thoughts and regurgitating them. And that's unfortunate. So in order to be torch bearers for Guanu's vision, you must, you must go back to the primary sources and interpret the information from your own perspective. And that's how we would build a curriculum that's going to raise the self-esteem of our young people so that they can understand that they truly stand on the shoulders of giants um, and not secondary actors or peripheral figures in the shadows, but the actual people who advance the cause of the state. This is the Liberia History Channel. We are honoring the legacy of Dr. Joseph C. Guano. So
17 September 1940 to August 29, 2022. And uh, if you want to call in to talk a little bit about Dr. Guan, pay a tribute, please call the number on the screen, 605-313-6004. The code is 7914-03. Call and then say something about Dr. Guano. If you were a student of Dr. Guano, a friend, a family member, or someone who, is, uh, who you read about, please uh, give us a call and let us honor the legacy of this great Liberian. At this time, let me uh, bring in some call or uh, some comments here from those watching. This one from uh, Bill and V, following live from Dennis Electronic Shop, Banga City, Bong County. That is not my shop, though. <laughs> Flomo Nunu, following from Logantown, Monrovia. Uh, Bill, Flomo, welcome to the show. And then I have an interesting comment here. Benedict Appleton say we shouldn't do what we are doing because we did not give him. For some reason, Benedict knows what happened between. He said, this is believed. I give the man his flower when he's alive, not when he's dead. Let's change our mentality. And this is false. He doesn't understand about this. Mohammed Salia Duplice, Prof. Kaur has always spoken about him like this, even when the man was alive. Can, uh, Calvin, we are saying there's nothing about Liberian history before 1940 that we can look up to be true. All respect to Dr. Guano for his work, but Liberian history is not truly known. And, all right, it's time to be corrected, so I get that. I told you, Benedict Appleton, there's nothing wrong discovering, discussing his legacy at this point. This is all about the life he lived, what he believed, and how he transferred it into writing. You are exactly right, Toby. Mohammed said, thank you, FOL, for this program. Dr. Guano's idea that our history needs to teach us patriotism and love for our heritage and the belief in oneness of all Liberians is really wonderful. He was far-sighted. His legacy will live on. Mephi Deco said, thanks, FOL. This is one of my beloved programs on this platform. Core is always awesome. Her insight on Liberian history is splendid. Thank you also, Mephi Deco. All right, uh, historian Jason Kasi, Salia Labrador did not exist until the 19th century. Always giving us uh, some of these uh, corrections. Oh, these are some of the comments. Yeah, so yeah, that was, uh, I think the comments were, were well um, thought out to the most part. Um, people who say that you know there was no Liberian history, so we have to understand that there was Liberia was created by literate people, so there is much documented um, on the state, the republic itself, and we need to understand the distinction between Liberia as a political entity and Liberia as a geographical location and the humans that were here before the political entity was created. Um, but again, uh, some of Dr. Guano's books go into that. Uh, many, many people have written uh, recently into that. Um, and, and the idea that you know there's no history is is, is not correct. Mm -hmm. We just have to we just have to um, instead of reading uh, uh, Charles Henry Hubrick, for example, who wrote the political and legislative history of Liberia in the mid uh, 20th century. We should be, as, as, as scholars, going back to the ACS primary source records and the, the, the actual writings and letters that were things documented by the people who were alive at the, creating, at the time the, the country was created and read those things for ourselves, formulate our own thoughts and put them into paper. Instead, you see people with PhDs quoting Hubrick. You're more educated than he was. And this is your country, this is your history. Why are you quoting someone who didn't even respect the humanity of your ancestors? Why wouldn't you go back to those primary source documents at, like he did in the mid 20th century? What makes him more of a scholar than you? You know, you've got people who've gone to the uh, highest level of education and they refuse to emphasize and study themselves in their own country. That is the unfortunate thing. And that's why you hear people say, oh, there's no Liberian history. There absolutely is. We just have uh, dropped the ball 
And each generation is responsible to pick up that torch of enlightenment and carry it forward and advance the cause of knowledge and understanding. And so when there was a period of time when, when the custodians of knowledge and information were racist, that time has passed. The custodians of knowledge and information are now scholars of all backgrounds, including Liberians. So there's just no excuse for us not to not to uh, do these things that, that um, we're capable of doing. There's just no excuse for it. If you're joining us, this is the Library History Channel. If you want to join the conversation to uh, pay tribute to Dr. Guano, 605-313-6004. The code is 791-791403. Um, call that number and let's have a discussion. Let's uh, talk about this great man. So, uh, still a few more comments here. Belly, Mingba, say hi, folks. Belly is watching from USA, Minnesota, the twin state. Elvis Morris here, yeah, our is a ardent follower here. Say, Prof. Joseph C. Guano is someone I admire for his scholarship and friendliness and honesty on telling of the librarian history. That is correct. Carl, if looking looking back at Dr. Guano, what do you think Dr. Guano wants us to uh, remember? How do you you think Dr. Guano wants us to look at Labyrinth history and how do we pick up the touch from where he starts? I think um, I think Dr. Guano would want us to do. Uh, we we having that we having that problem again, Carl. Yeah. Keep calling. Okay, I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, please, uh, it will be right back. Liberian history needs to be rewritten. It needs to be rewritten because it does not, it does not include uh, many of the makers of Liberian history. For example, Madame Swakoku is not, has not been in our history until very, very recently. It has not been, or she has not been in our history. I'm talking about written history, not oral history. Oral history, yes, she is there. But written history, or accomplishments, what impact did she make on government? What impact did she make on her own society? We need to know about, we need to do more about this. When we talk about Madame Swako, we're talking about all the, the Madame Swakokos, from Cape Mount to Cape Palmas, from Vitaun to Vonjama. We need to have them included. And to do so, we need to make some sacrifices. All right. Well, my, my, my question for uh, the legacy, what does Dr. Guanu want from us today? I would say uh, Dr. Guanu would want us to uh, advance what he was able to do um, because we have more resources available to us than he did. Not only can we build upon the work he did, but we have more access to more information than he did. And with the uh, with the advancements in so many sciences that even support history. I mean, for goodness sakes, you've got um, people using DNA science and, and linguistics has advanced so much as well. Um, and, 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 you know, the recategorization of languages and, and there's just been so much innovation just in the last 25 years that was not available to Dr. Guano in the 70s and 80s that now younger or, or this generation of scholars can build upon and even advance, advance the story even more um, effectively and efficiently. I think uh, he would want us to pick up the torch and carry it that much further. Uh, history is something that uh, is, 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 is growing. It's growing as human knowledge and information advances and our understanding of things advances. So I, I think he was very clear in his last statement, which was Liberian history needs to be rewritten. And again, when he talks about history, he's talking about the curriculum, the story in its written form, the story in its uh, comprehensive form that's presented to students um, that, needs to be, that needs to be reassessed. And the, and the emphasis needs to be directed towards uh, everyone, not just uh, a particular story as it makes you, it glorifies Europe and European perspectives. 
any of the work of uh, Dr. Guano you want to uh, briefly kind of talk about? So there's all of the books that you talked about, but I think for, for researchers, the Historical Dictionary uh, of Liberia, that's a compilation of work um, of Dr. Guano, Dr. Dunn, Dr. Sawyer, uh, 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 um, Dr. Um, Burroughs, uh, is important work. That was a collaboration that they worked on together. Uh, as you research, you'll come across names and information. You can reference the historical dictionary. If you're, for example, just to be simplistic, for example, if you read, okay, this is the boozy, who are they? You go to the historical dictionary, it will tell you exactly who the boozy people were. Um, or if you see a name that you're not familiar with, you go to the historical dictionary, you can flip through, oh, okay, this is who they're referencing. It, that, that comprehensive book helped us to understand um, everything else that we, especially digging through primary source um, uh, uh, documents, helps you to understand. Um, but Liberia, um, I prefer, you know, his, his textbooks that he wrote, um, Liberia history uh, up to 1847, um, that's important, you know, because what Dr. Guanu is doing there is he's setting the context for the that the people who existed in the territory were not just, you know, running around naked and afraid without complex systems of, of, of organized uh, governance, uh, trade, economics, all of those things. Um, Dr. Burroughs has also built upon that. Um, and we have some young scholars like Dr. Jasim Carr who are specifically studying systems that were uh, specific to our region. And we just need to continue to advance that cause. I don't think there's anyone, even if you're getting a PhD in economics or political science or anything, uh, if you're Liberian, you should be also understanding how that relates to your people in the context of your existence. How are you gonna advance the knowledge pool of information for, you know, the people who are going to come after us. Um, you know, doing something innovative in the Liberian context, no matter what your, your your area of study is, I think is important. Thank you. You have a you have a question here from uh, Riverside Nation. Is it called "How Did Dr. Guano Change Your Perspective of Our History"? Uh, I wouldn't say Dr. Guano changed my perspective. And I'm not, you know, that he didn't change my perspective on history because um, I was brought up. I've been I've been studying history my entire life since I was, I was a natural child. So I was mentored by people who were very centered in their Africanness. I think Dr. Guanu being uniquely um, positioned as a Liberian person centered in his Africanness. Um, is, is, is what is, makes him important, but he's not the first African-centered uh, um, person that I've studied. What Dr. Guanu did is not change my perspective, but I think deepen my understanding of our tradition, our oral history. I already understood <laughs> who we were before becoming familiar with Dr. Guanu's work. And what it did is just reinforced it. Um, the, 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 the stories that he, the perspective of the stories that he told, I grew up hearing because I'm a mono woman and I grew up with, 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 with family. My mother, um, uncles and others are, are very deeply rooted in our oral traditions. So Dr. Guanu reinforced that for, for me. Um, but as a student of African world history, I've always been very much centered in, in seeing things from an African perspective. Th thank you, Carl. Well, uh, we still don't have calls here, so we're going to be okay. uh, uh, drawing down the curtains. <laughs> we'll be drawing down the curtains, and we really appreciate this time. We want to keep it shut here so that people really remember this great Liberian. Right. Oh, finally, let's. Uh, Let's close on, on, on this one. Um, or just give me a final word on Dr. Guano. For, for yeah, the, so uh, for people for, yeah, for people who aren't familiar with Dr. Guano's work, I think people need to study it. One of the controversial things, I, I you know what, let me bring this up since no one's calling in. 
I hear a lot from people, oh, Dr. Guanu said, you know, the Madingo people just came to Liberia in the 19th century. So there's a lot of controversy around that. And people think of Dr. Guanu as, as uh, dismissing the presence of Madingos prior to the 19th century. What we have to understand is when historians are talking about migratory patterns of people historically, ethnic groups, uh, especially a massive, massive uh, uh, ethnic linguistic group like the Mandingos did not come to Liberia to the Grain Coast all at once in one wave. When Dr. Guanu is speaking of a recent migration, what he is talking about is what is obvious, which is the fall of the Wusu Empire. That was the most um, prolific and it was the largest migration of people from the north into Nimba, Lofa, and Bong. Once Wosolo fell, we've alluded to it earlier in the show, you had this massive influx of, of, of people who spoke the Malinka language, Madingo language. And that is what Dr. Guan was, was, was talking about. He was accurate. And that did occur um, in 1898 when Wosolo fell. Does that mean that there were not people who came down the St. Paul River that were not trading uh, 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 Malinka, people coming all the way from Putajalan, people coming all the way from Kankan region, all the way to the coast, even before Liberia was established. No, that's, that's not what that's saying. And people have to realize that when we're talking about history, if someone says that this group came down after this thing occurred, it doesn't mean that that is the only migration of people from the north. We also had an influx from the empire of Songhe fell. We also had an influx of people when the empire of Mali fell. You know, so human beings have migrated to the Grain Coast, not only as traders, but also as refugees from the empires. And the last Malinka empire was Wosulu, which was created by Samori Ture. So for those of you who uh, were uh, uncomfortable with Dr. Guanu's assertion, he is 100% correct. Um, in the context of what he was speaking, which is that Wosolo fell. And one of the things I've also realized is we hyper-focus on ethnicity. When someone says that this group migrated, it makes the group feel that they're somehow not Liberian. This is outrageous. This is outrageous. The facts of history are the facts of history. It doesn't make a person any less Liberian. It is just a fact of history. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand things happened the way they did. We should be proud of every aspect of it. Yeah. We should accept the, the facts of it and not try to cover it up or think of it as some kind of prejudice. Uh, it's beautiful that Wosulu fell and the people who came from the Wosulu Empire were welcomed. Thank you. We, we got we got a caller here. Call out your name and where you calling from. How you want to call? <laughs> hey, John. It's River says, how you doing? Right. Hello. Hello. Oh, how are you sound? I've never heard your voice Hello, before. Abraham. Okay, Abraham, what's the last name? Vinton. Oh, Abraham Vinton. Go ahead, A.B. Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, I just want to ask a question to Cisco. I know I, I asked a question about her. Um, about how Joseph Wano uh, has changed her pers perspective of history. She said uh, it hasn't changed much, but uh, it deepened it. question because I listened, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I heard a little bit of what she said, but I listened to him and he said that our history needs to be rewritten. And uh, so why isn't there a collective effort? I'm not talking about sporadically like her and other people here and there. Why hasn't there been a collective effort to rewrite our history that clearly that clearly, uh, clearly identifies us. Why do we look in America when they found out that a lot of those names, those campus, those 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 monuments, like the, you know the red skin, the names of things that they have racial connotation, what did they do? They eliminated it. We got some of those names over there, that the Nipo Street, Matilda Nipo, a lady who is believed to have killed the native. Look, I'm, I'm not trying to bring anything by there, but that's like, like, like she said, that's part of our history. We have to explain it. Why do we still have some of those names of people who sold slaves, 
you know, some of those names are uh, crucial view, like some of those people, those white people or other people who were involved in slave trade into uh, along our coast. Why do we still have their names uh, in on streets and areas and other things? Why hasn't there been a collective effort to come together and combat some of these names as, you know, look behind, if they, you know, the origin of these names, because we just accept Benson Street. Some of these people we don't even know what, what role they play in our history. They could have been slave traders, you know, got people who killed the indigenous. But yet we accept those street names. Why hasn't there been an effort since for who, to get together and, and, and you know, revisit those names, those areas, and then come up with a genuine history that will be generally accepted by the library people? Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, River says, so the two yeah. things, right? You talk about the history because the history is already there. And the next thing you talk yeah. about is the name. So let me let your uh, call answer that. Yeah, take take take, take your mouth from on Stephen Allen Benson, one of my favorite like room presidents. <laughs> Benson Street shall remain. <laughs> uh Stephen Allen Benson, that's the one that was that was uh, uh kidnapped when he was six years old. The day took him and he, he, he learned how to speak day. They they basically brought him up as a native child, returned him to the people. So we're gonna keep Benson Street. Um, but you're right. We need to understand who these people were. Then we, we will know that, that 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 their names are not are not bad things. Uh, we will keep our Roysville. We'll keep all of these things. Uh, you know, do we need just the Stockton Creek need to be called Stockton Creek? Does Bushrod Island need to be called Bushrod Island? I don't know. You know, that's for the the the, the legislature. To decide, and the legislature makes these decisions when the citizens themselves um, make that call. And so, the, but the most important thing that you said is we need to understand the history because you get your job up because I mean you just included you just included Stephen Allen Benson in the same breath with slave traders because again it's it's not knowing the history you don't know who he is, and so that's very important. We have to understand who these people were and what their contribution to the advancement of the cause of not only Liberia, but African people globally was. Stephen Allen Benson was a Pan-Africanist. He was a great thinker. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll get to those things. Uh, there are people working on in, improving the curriculum. Dr. Joseph Seguanu did rewrite Liberian history. Uh, what he's talking about is we need to take it further. And there is a committee of people. You've got... Um, Dr. Allen at the University of Liberia that heads a group. I mean, those are the people who are the custodians of our history. Dr. Dunn and others are on that group. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jacine Codd is other historians that are working together to advance the cause of knowledge of Liberianists. Uh, but we can't jump up and say we're gonna erase things that we don't understand. Let's first seek to understand before we seek to destroy. They end up destroying your own heroes along with the monsters. And then as far as, you know, because you don't know who they are, you don't know their story. Um, Matilda Newport was a real person. She was a real person. And she was um, the descendant of, 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 of re repatriated people. She lived through a massacre with the day. She didn't fire any cannon killing natives. The story is a myth. It is a myth just like the story of Betsy Ross is a myth um, in the United States history. Betsy Ross didn't really sold the American flag, and that's pretty much common knowledge now. But, you know, so most countries create these myths. And as I said, this was a myth that was created by people who created our curriculums, missionaries and others. So does it mean Matilda Newport herself was evil? No, she came in this country, she went to Liberia as Matilda Spencer. And, and she later on, when her husband was killed, married someone named Newport, but that was long after long after the so-called battle at Crown Hill, you know, supposedly happened. But there's no primary source documents that confirm that this woman ever killed anyone. So we just need to understand the story of our history, um, the people who were recaptured and the people who repatriated uh, from, from the United States played a massive role, not only in setting a tone uh, for the liberation of African people that occurred later on after the, the uh, partitioning of Africa. But it set a tone for us indigenous Liberians to not have been French or, or British subjects. This is something for us to be very proud of. It should not be erased. I am happy that I'm not waving, you know, the Sierra Leone flag or the Guinea flag over my head. I'm proud to be a Liberian. And I know that my forefathers... I, we're Liberians by choice. 
because the other option was to have been Guinean or Ivorian or Sierra Leonean. Thank you. We have one more caller here. Call your name and where you calling from? Uh, hi. Um, uh, good morning from my end. My name is Mohamed Salia Dupli. I'm calling from Sydney, Australia. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Coles for uh, what you've been saying there, there today. And thanks to FOL for bringing out this show. Uh, i like to say one thing uh, to reinforce what's been said. That is, the idea that um, our history is supposed to teach us to be patriotic. That the history is supposed to teach us to be, to feel like we want united family as Liberians. is laudable and is one legacy of uh, uh, Dr. Osegan that we all you supposed to remember. And hopefully, we all are going to start the beginning of that journey to take that message forth because we didn't know, we didn't think that the history was supposed to be that. And thank God we have people like Professor Cole who is stepping in that direction. So uh, we, we're proud and thank you very much. That's what I have to say. Thank, thank you. you. Just to let everyone know, I'm not actually a professor, but Mohammed calls me that. It's like a nickname, so I beg y'all. <laughs> y'all pull. Y'all like to put big, big titles on people's heads. Make sure everybody call you <laughs> Professor Paul. So we have to live. We have to live up to these big titles. But no, uh, I'm not actually a professor. I'm a student of history. But, but thank you so much, Carl. Let's uh, have your closing comments on the subject again. Yeah. This oh. is uh, a tribute to Dr. Joseph C. Guano. We are honoring the legacy of Dr. Guano, who passed away August 29. So thank you, um, uh, Mohammed and, and uh, Abraham, for calling in uh, and, and sharing your thoughts. Uh, thanks for following the show as much as you do. Um, I will start next week uh, by discussing the Liberian president. We're going to start with Joseph Jenkins Roberts. And, uh, and we're going to talk about J.J. Roberts from the, from the perspective of the people, right? So this is the people's history of Liberia as, as you know, following the legacy of, of Dr. Guano and others. Um, so we're going to tell the story of Joseph Jenkins Roberts from the perspective of Liberians, not from the perspective of ACS. And uh, uh, it's going to be very interesting. So please tune in next week. Tell a friend. Tell your friend's friend. And, you know, each one tell one until we, we are able to spread um, the, 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 the complete and very positive uh, story of our history. I think many of you that have been following the show still seem to think that there's some ugly undertone to like in history. There is no country that exists in the world that did not come, that, you know, that was created or born of, of peace and flowers and rainbows and dove, you know, it, but the story of Liberia is so beautiful in comparison to that of other places that I've studied, including the United States where I live. The story of Liberia is so, so, so profound and so important to African world history. We should be proud of it. And the only reason we lack that pride in our history is because we lack knowledge and understanding of it. So please join us next week. We're going to begin with our series with presidents, um, starting with Joseph Jenkins Roberts. Thank you. I can't wait to uh, start the presidents of Liberia because I grew up just memorizing their names. Don't even know their contribution to the country. So please uh, keep it here at Focus on Liberia, where we educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. Join us tomorrow, uh, 1 p.m. We have the new day. 4 p.m. We have on point, and 6 p.m. We have prime time Sunday with, of course, the well-rounded host. Uh, we have a few comments here. Dr. Jason Kase, thank you for that. Every country on this earth has trouble history. Uh, Sam, say, call you are brilliant, and I can't stop listening to you when you speak. Hey. You speak. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Dave said, our children should not just recite names or add contents to the name. My condolence for the hero that has gone to rest. Jason also call you an excellent, a true scholar. Well, we uh, again say thank you so much for watching. 
at this time we're going to uh and jason also want to be nice to me okay thank you jason. <laughs> it's a great program at this time we want to close with our song that says we are all liberians true representatives standing on the shoulders of a great scholar dr joseph C. Guano. Yes. so that's how we close with the song that says we are all liberians whether you came from the north uh, or whether you came from the southeast what are you came from the uh, West? We are all Liberians, and let us do everything. I mean, everything to carry forth the legacy of Dr. Guano. Good night and God bless you. We are all